Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Tuesday, May 3, 2022. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? Well, we have Kabuki Theater coming up tomorrow afternoon. Wednesday afternoon is quote unquote the FOMC announcement. What they're going to do is announce the rise in interest rates that they're projecting based on how they're going to manage the short end of the yield curve. Okay, fair enough. None of that really matters right now. All that matters is the market reaction to whatever the Fed says tomorrow afternoon. If the market likes what the Fed says, it's going to go up. If the market doesn't like what the Fed says, it's going to go down. At this point, It's a coin toss. You don't know what the Fed is going to say that's going to have a positive or negative reaction. You don't know until after the fact. So what we're going to do from this point forward is take a look at the daily chart. We'll do our normal assessment. We'll provide some important numbers. We're going to talk about a couple of things that I never got to in last night or Monday's video. So we've got a little Tuesday surprise. What are our expectations coming into Wednesday? Well, maybe the market will be up a little bit. Maybe it'll be down a little bit. But odds are that it's not going to get very far away from where it was today. Now, all things considered, the market traded in a relatively narrow range. It wasn't really narrow when we think about how many points there were from high to low. But you have to get used to the increase in volatility expands the amount of points that the market's going to move in either direction. So all in all, the market traded in a range today. It's likely going to trade in another range tomorrow until the Fed announcement is cleared out of the way. Then what happens? The market whips around for a while. She goes up. She goes down. She goes up and down. And then she finally picks a direction and goes from there. Usually, the first three or four moves are wrong. Let's do a couple of things on both sides of the tape. Let's say the market is bearish. Let's say they come below yesterday's low, 405.02. Look out below. Inside the number members will have numbers below. But just as an aside, and here's the weekly chart, we're not going to have the expectation that the 100 period moving average is going to be support if they're failing. They're going to hit 400. They're likely going to spike through 400, and we'll have numbers accordingly. What if it's bullish? Well, we look at the chart, and we see a big breakdown candle. Fair enough. So what do they normally do? They normally try and run a test up near the high of the breakdown candle. Whether they get to the high, get close to the high, we're going to say if they're pushing higher, they should get to at least 422, likely higher. Now. Here's another thing we need to know. Either way, if there's a flood of volume and we expect there to be, after the Fed announcement, the market can move or gobble up a lot of points in a very short period of time. A very short period of time. Guessing which way the market's going to go before the Fed announcement, hoping you're right, really isn't a trading strategy. Some of you will do it anyway. And when it happens, about 80% of you will be wrong. Now, how is that? How come it's not 50-50? Believe me, about 80% of you will be wrong. The market will go one way, you'll get scared out of the position. Ten minutes later, you would have made three grand. That's just the way it works. Some of that I say tongue-in-cheek, but you all know how this works. The market's going to whip around. That's the main theme. 422, 423 on the upside, anything north of that, and she's likely in squeeze mode, pie in the face mode. Running a test of yesterday's low, that's one thing. Closing hourly, closing any candle below yesterday's low, and then repeated closes below yesterday's low, and they're falling to 400 and below. Tomorrow is Kabuki Theater Day. So far, from a technical perspective, Here's the February lows that we talked about ad nauseum. The low is 41064. We mentioned that at least 378 times. What have they done so far? What was really going on down here? All they really did when you just 
step back and you look at the big picture, what they did was they ran a test and spiked below a breakup candle low and they closed above it, period. That doesn't mean they'll sustain price above it, but that's what happened right now, thus far. That's normal garden variety market behavior, even though we're not in a normal garden variety market. But you see where I'm going with this. Even when the market is out of the ordinary, they still find a way to do the normal thing inside the abnormal. The problem area is off the weekly chart. The low here, 415.79. That's the low they gave up on close last week. They're going to challenge that. We talked about it last night. They're above it on close today. But we need to see what happens on weekly close. Now, let's talk about one of the things that I didn't get a chance to talk about last night. There was too much stuff in there. We're talking about cycles. Now, I'm not going to peel back the onion 15, 20 layers and talk about cycles for four hours. What I'm going to do is point something out. This is a prevalent cycle. This is something that just can't be ignored. There's other cycles. There's other parts to the art form of how this works. What I'm going to show you isn't that meaningful in and of itself. It's awareness type information, but you have other cycles, or if you have other cycles that coincide with what I'm going to show you, then all of a sudden it starts to add credence to what we're going to see. Now, what I'm going to show you, and I'm using the Dow Jones Industrial Average because my S&P chart doesn't go back this far. What we're looking at is called a 60-year cycle. What does that mean? It means that cycles happen to repeat specific ones over and over. Not every time. It doesn't always work like that. But there's 30-year cycle, a 90-year cycle, a 120. A 60-year cycle is a prevalent cycle. Okay, you're going to have to take my word on that for now. Now, this doesn't look exactly the same as today's chart. However, what catches my eye is the fact that here's a high made in March of 1962. And the market went down all the way through June. Now, it's different from today. However, if we're going to go down into a cycle low, and that's really what I'm focused on, the cycle low. Where is a cycle low going to come? Well, there's other cycles that point to other dates. However, this one has my eye. It's interesting. So I want to point it out because everybody needs to be aware that if the market is going to remain weak, just keep something in mind. The market can always travel in both directions a whole lot farther than people ever really believe that it can. Remember the people that were saying, hey, the market's never going to come down. It's going to go up forever. Where are those people? They were wrong. What about the people in the pandemic low in 2020? Weren't they saying that the market was going to collapse a whole lot more than it did? They were wrong. Most people are wrong most of the time. That's the phenomenon about the market. It's easy to be a bull in a bull market. It's not so easy to read a tape in a bear market. So here, the market really started going down from about the middle part of March. Now here's today's tape. It's a different chart. Here's the end of March. Now, it's two weeks removed. These cycles are not exactly perfect every time. In fact, they rarely are. It's the big picture concept. We're talking about a market that has a tendency to repeat at some point in time, 60 years later. We have to give it a little bit of rope. Just food for thought. It's more of awareness stuff than anything else. But if the market continues down, this is the way we're going to view it. If the market continues down, making new lows, then my antennas are going to go up for, is the market really going to go down for like another five, six weeks? It's possible. Anything is possible. We have to be prepared for either side. We're the umpire calling balls and strikes. Remember, and don't forget this, write this on a sticky note. Whether the market scales down in a crash formation now, whether it happens at some point in the future, it will happen again. It has happened in the past. It will always happen again. It's a function of markets. There's going to be a number that when closed below creates a vacuum to the downside to the magnitude. And I've said this before, so nobody should be surprised at this. To the magnitude most of you 
haven't seen before. If you came into the market within the last few years, you're in the crypto stuff, the NFP stuff, or NFT, whatever that stuff is, you came in in a bull market, and it ended, and you don't really know that it ended yet, and you've never seen a bear market, you need to put your seatbelt on. You need to be careful. You need to not be in the way of a bear market if you don't understand how it works. We will see absolute rip-your-face-off rallies in between. Case in point, let's just say the market takes what the Fed says and it likes it, and it's going to relieve some of this quote-unquote, and I hate this term, you know that, the oversold condition. They're going to get a bounce from the breakup candle low, more than we've seen already. They tested the low, now they're going to relieve some of this oversold condition, they're going to run up into these moving averages or close to it, something like that. Let's just say that's the case. You're going to see the market up to 250 handles in like two to four days. That's the way it works. We've seen it before. You're going to see it again. It's the flip side of you will see a crash formation. We just can't tell you what day. If somebody knows, send me an email. Inside the numbers, let's run through the numbers. What I'm going to do, because it was a rather quiet day, it was rather up and down volatile, but the other side of rather is it was a trading range. They went up, they went down. They never really had any conviction to go anywhere with the Fed announcement or Kabuki Theater looming tomorrow. But let's look to see how the numbers worked out anyway. So here it is. You can read the notes, pause the video, go back to the chart, double check the work. I'm going to pull out some important stuff today. 41450, that's important. 41675, 418 and a quarter. Let's see how those numbers fare out. Here we go. Right at the vertical is today's activity. 41450, as you'll see later in the notes, that's our pivot. Below the bears have the ball, above the bulls have the ball. Doesn't mean they can get very far, but they have the ball. 41450 was the pivot. Now, the next spot above that was 41675. Look at this. They come up short, they make a high of 41670. What you'll see later in the notes is that became unfinished business. Where did they go back to? The pivot. They found support at the pivot. Then, instead of stopping at the unfinished business, that's kind of the tip off of the market sometimes. We see this all the time. They have a level, a number that they need to reach. They come up short, whether it's on the downside or the upside. The next time up or down, they're going to go somewhere else. It's kind of like the tip off. They're not going to stop at the unfinished business most of the time. They're going somewhere else. Where were they going today? 418.25. Pretty much, that was it. They spiked it a little bit, but these are the numbers. Doesn't mean they can't spike them, but they need to close candles above over and over and over again to open the door for the next price. Let's look at the 418.25 from a 15-minute perspective. How many candles did they close above that price? One 15-minute candle all day, the next one immediately failed. They tested it, tested it, tested it. They came back to test it. They tried. They failed. Where'd they go? About right back to the pivot. Funny how that works. If you know your numbers, you can have success in the market. If you don't know your numbers, you're going to struggle. Let's see what else we have in the notes. Remember, Friday, there's no inside the numbers. Much below 414, that wasn't the pivot, but below 414 opens the door for 412. They spiked 414 a couple times, but they never could really sustain price under there, so they ended up snapping back, so the lower stuff didn't come into play today. 41260, 412, they never got there, so we can skip over it. What did they do? They kept repeating the same numbers. 41675, it's on the table. 41450 is still the pivot. You'll see this over and over and over again. There's your unfinished business at 41675. They came close. A nickel short isn't good enough. They've been missing numbers for two weeks. So I notice that stuff every single day. Where do they miss them most of the time? They miss them on the high side, meaning the bulls can't get to the numbers. That means the bears are in control. I just take that away from the market. It's something I file away in my head. The trend is down. They're going to come up short of numbers on the upside, and they're likely going to spike through the numbers on the downside. Think about the opposite of what we had in the bull market. So the market goes up every day, and they end up 
giving into resistance and then spiking through and then going to the next number. They just kept going higher. A lot of times they would come up short of the numbers on the downside. So what happens if you look in the mirror? What happens if you put the chart in the mirror, flip it upside down? It's the same thing that's going on now the other way. Food for thought, we're moving along. 4.14.50, that's it. As long as they stay above 4.16.75 on the table and higher, they did the higher, they did the 4.18 and a quarter, and that's what we had. They got to the targets, they fell back down. They made another push, they fell back down. They stayed in a range. Pause the video, read the notes, go back to the chart to double check the work. The market by definition, generally speaking, the majority of the time is pretty quiet. They're quote unquote waiting on the Fed leading into the announcement, Tuesday and Wednesday. That's just normal. Stocks on the move are kind of quiet today. Not a lot on the board, bright and early at zero dark 30. We had one hit its entry objective, VRNS. The other ones didn't. Clorox, DD, and EL did not hit their objectives, so they're off the board. They're no trade. So we did get one trade from stocks on the move, and traders that wanted to trade the SPY, they had the numbers, they had the targets, they had their trade. Quick look at VRNS getting a haircut at the open. The number happened to be the lower number. What's interesting is the low today was 35.53. The stop on the board was an hourly close below 35.90. So they spiked it. That's an important spot. They never closed an hour below it. If you painted by the numbers, you ended up with a pretty good trade. Took a while. It's not easy. This isn't an easy business. Sometimes they give you an immediate rocket ride. Other times, they make you sweat it out. This one, they kind of took you to the brink. They went to the stop, they went below the stop, and they did it right into the end of the hour. We go on hourly closes below the stop. Guess what? They spiked it, they snapped right back before the hourly closed, the hour closed above it, and she took off to the upside. That, my friends was a test of an important spot. The stops are also an important spot, just like the numbers that we want for our entry targets. This is how the market works. They bring you to the brink. They want to see who has the conviction to stay with the trade. What's going on over in Camp IWM? What are we going to see there? Well, we're going to see the same thing across all the markets. It's all the same market. If the market rallies big after the Fed, everything's going to get a rally slash rising tide lifts all boats operation. And if they kill the tape after the Fed, everything's going to get killed. Everything. Which way is it exactly going to go after the Fed? Well, they're going to go both ways a number of times. Which direction are they going to go for the larger move? I don't know. We're going to find out tomorrow. I can't guess at that. Nobody really knows. It's all dependent on how the market interprets and takes Not what the Fed does. It's going to be very dependent how the market reacts to what they say, specifically what they say going forward. Forget about what happened in the past. Forget about where inflation was six months ago, 50 years ago. It doesn't really matter. What the market wants to know is, what do we got going forward? I need to prepare for the future. Hence, I can't tell you anything about the IWM until we see which way the market goes, or any of the other markets for that matter. This one, on the other hand, remains a canary in the coal mine. Let me reiterate, low, higher low, higher low, completely different than all the other markets. This is my favorite canary in the coal mine, and it's been that way for a long, long time. That's why I watch it all day, every day, on close, during the day. I can't help but notice they did not make a lower low for some reason, unbeknownst. They got higher lows, and it is the canary in the coal mine. Now, if everything fails, it's likely the transports fail. But what I'm looking at is, is this giving us a hint of what's to come? We'll find out sooner than later. What about the Qs? Nothing going on here. It's in the same position it was yesterday. They didn't really go anywhere today at the end of the day because we're quote-unquote waiting on the Fed. There's nothing different we can tell you today than we didn't say yesterday about the Qs, as with the other markets. XLF, same routine, will be very volatile after the Fed. The financials, of course, the financials are very interest rate sensitive. So what we know now could be completely thrown out the window 
we're either going to find the financials up at 37, 37 and a half, or they're going to be making new lows. Not necessarily all tomorrow, but in short order, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm looking at. By the way, food for thought. We're back to the SPY. So here's the daily chart, and I put this trend line in. Why? Just in case. Now, I'm not saying they're getting there tomorrow or this week. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if the market starts to rally, if she starts to trade away from the lows, keep an eye on this trend line. Why? Because, think about it, the market went back and forth for several days in this area. Then it broke down. So whether it broke down officially from here or here, we don't really know. It broke down from here from the high of the day. But the point is, is that the market broke down from this spot. So what do they like to do? They like to rally back to former breakout and former breakdown areas. Okay, fair enough. Well, as you go forward in time, this downsloping trend line gets lower and lower and lower. So you just know where it is. So let's say we're over here at 436, sooner 440, you never know. I don't think it's going to be very easy for the market to get above this trend line. This is a big deal. Put that trend line on a sticky note. Smash mouth. Same routine as all the other markets. It's in a downtrend, so anything goes after Kabuki Theater. They could get a rally up to 250. They could make new lows. Net-net, we just don't know. We have to wait for the Fed. Just like everybody else, we're waiting on the Fed. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're pulling the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.